Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christine Parthamore. I'm the CEO of the Council on Strategic Risk. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C., dedicated to addressing systemic risk to security in the 21st century. Uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic that's affecting the world so dramatically shows us uh, very vividly what systemic risk to security mean for all of our countries individually and for the world at large in the international community. Uh, we are very happy to have with us today um, for a, a second conversation, Dr. Tomoya Saito. He's the director of the Department of Health Crisis Management at Japan's National Institute of Public Health. He has deep experience in emergency preparedness and response, health surveillance and biosecurity. He's worked for Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare and assisted after the Fukushima nuclear accident, uh, among many other experiences that he's currently bringing uh, to the battle against COVID-19 in Japan. Uh, we're very pleased to have him with us today. Uh, as I learned uh, since my time in, gov in government and then certainly subsequently, uh, one of the most important things that we can all do to prepare for uh, risks, uh, transnational threats and risks uh, in this century that are coming at us and that we're dealing with today is to share lessons, uh, especially among close allies and friends like the United States and Japan, um, but among all of our countries internationally. Um, Japan is one of the countries that is uh, handling the pandemic uh, with the lowest, some of the lowest rates of mortality uh, and casualties in the world. Um, so it behooves us to take uh, whatever lessons can be offered by those experts who are part of that response. Saito-san, we're therefore very, very grateful to have you with us again today to share some of those lessons. Um, for CSR, uh, one of our, one of the issue sets that we've been having discussions with among American experts over the last few weeks since we last spoke uh, is on early detection uh, and biosurveillance and how do, how do you collect the data that you need and get it to the people who need it uh, for decision-making purposes. Uh, it's said that Japan detected the infection patterns uh, of COVID-19 at a very early stage um, can you tell us a little bit about how the detection of the infection occurred in Japan, uh, how it was early, and then perhaps a little bit about what the national biosurveillance system is like um, that I'm sure played a critical role in this detection? Well, we have a biosurveillance system under the infectious disease control role, but as you know, this is a new infectious disease, so we do not have the category for such disease. But we could detect the first case in 15th January through an undiagnosed serious infectious illness surveillance. So this surveillance was started last year to detect an emerging disease that is not covered by the usual surveillance. Through this reporting protocol, the first case was notified and the clinical sample was tested in NIID, National Institute of Infectious Disease. So as you know, we had a rugby World Cup last year, and this year we are planning the Tokyo Olympic Games. So this surveillance was one of the enforcing measures of our uh, surveillance system for hosting such mass gathering events, because we have to detect some new emerging disease even in such uh, mass gathering event. That should be a very sensitive one. So, and uh, the system works very well. And later, the PCR diagnosis capacity was available in local public health laboratories in all prefectures. And at the end of January, the COVID-19 was designated as a notifiable disease. And in Japan, a call center was established in every prefecture for people who returned from endemic area or who have contact with cases and developed fever and respiratory, respiratory illness. So do those who satisfy the criteria were referred to a designated outpatient center for further testing. And those who were tested positive were all notified and isolated and treated in the hospital. Then the close contacts were identified through the interview of the patients by a public health center and asked to stay home and monitored for two weeks. That was the basic protocol for the early stage. Thank you. And uh, following up on that, that's that's a very helpful outline of what uh, what occurs. Um, and it sounds like some of the activities sort of at, at the local and prefecture level 
Um, one of the, the issues that we've come across in the United States uh, is on the transmission of uh, really critical data from state and local public health centers to the federal government. So um, many of the experts we've spoken with in the last few weeks have complained, for example, that uh, they still have to transmit certain data by fax machine and on paper uh, and getting that digitized and then to the federal authorities to inform their decision making or to other public health centers uh, is becoming a very challenging uh, process uh, in the United States. Uh, is the system that you described that has been set up uh, and uh, sounds like augmented in advance of the, the Tokyo, Tokyo Olympics as well, um, does that have a, a more seamless uh, sort of digital pathway from the data from where it's collected up to the federal government? That's a very good question because we do have a similar problem because in our system, doctors had to report the case to a local public health center by a fax machine. But then local public health centers registered the case in the electronic national surveillance system, mm -hmm. which is directly shared with the NIID and the Ministry of Health. So that was our very robust system in the peacetime. However, as the number of incident increases, hospitals and public health centers were overwhelmed and the case registration in the electronic system was getting delayed. So now we started to develop a new electronic case registration and follow-up system, uh, which will be connected to a contact apps later. And now hospitals can register cases electron electronically, electronically so directly to the system, not by the fax machine. But, and all the municipalities already started to use this new system, but many adjustments will be needed to fully use its uh, expected functions. Well, it's unfortunate, it's a little bit, um, it's good to hear in a way that we're not the only country that's still dealing with fax machines <laughs> as part of their systems. Um, and I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully we can continue to learn more about how Japan and other countries are transitioning um, their system in light of these challenges and adapting uh, to be able to handle the pandemic well. Thank you so much. Um, and so, of course, the data that we have then gets inputted into modeling and prediction systems um, that then can inform authorities about patterns that may emerge or that may be starting to emerge so that we can do forward planning about how to reopen the economy and things like that. Um, obviously, with the data challenges that we have in the United States, that's been the modeling and confidence in, in the modeling predictions and projections uh, is, I think, a little bit less confident than in some other countries. Uh, in, uh, in Japan, is there uh, a little higher confidence in some of the modeling and predictions um, based on both the disease patterns that you've seen, but also confidence in the data that you've been collecting? Uh, that's a very good question, too, because, in, you know, modeling and the uh, now uh, forecasting is a kind of new technology to be free used in the um, modern infectious disease control. And I haven't compared with such modeling capacity and its accuracy between the United States and Japan, but this time, Ministry of Health closely worked with a modeling team in a university. The team members were all assigned to the Ministry of Health Emergency Operations Center, EOC, as temporary advisors and provided mathematical analysis and sometimes uh, real-time forecasting. So they did an excellent job giving useful insights on the situation assessment. However, we would have been better to have several multiple modeling groups and discuss over multiple modeling and prediction results. That would be better and uh, expected in the near future. But anyhow, uh, this is the first time to fully employ such real-time modeling and forecasting to encounter emerging disease crisis. So it was a really good experience for us. Excellent. Yeah, and um, hopefully for all of our countries, we can take these experiences then, uh, of course, and apply them to how to improve early warning and uh, detection as well as modeling and projection uh, for future outbreaks. Excellent. Um, and I understand that uh, some of the early detection uh, and um, understanding of how the disease might break out across Japan, um, but certainly the, the surveillance and detection that occurred early there 
also informed the government's leadership in setting up um, the strategy of avoiding three C's. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the three C's are to be avoided and a little bit about um, how the government decided to uh, and enacted and went forward with deploying that with the people of Japan in order to help curtail the pandemic? In Japan, we had a, a several learning opportunities in a uh, very early phase of this pandemic. So first, we had the uh, repatriates from Wuhan at the end of January. So they returned to Japan by a chartered flight, government chartered flight, and quarantined for two weeks. So through their screening and health monitoring for two weeks, we could learn the proportion of asymptomatic cases. And next, we experienced the Diamond Princess outbreak. It was a quite tough operation to quarantine a large number of tourists in the ship and also to manage a large number of severe cases. And during this uh, outbreak management, we could realize the severity and the transmiss transmissibility of this disease. So it was a good wake up call for us to give a certain attention to this disease. So besides these operations, we were struggling finding cases under a limited PCR capacity. Mass screening, like, mass screening like operation was not a feasible option for us. But at that time, we were wondering why few close contacts develop a disease during prospective health monitoring, but epidemic continues. Through investigation of the early 100 cases, we realized that most cases did not infect others, but some infected many, forming a cluster. So we assumed that there should always be a cluster behind a case as a source of infection. Thus, we emphasize the retrospective contact tracing to find such source, thereby find a cluster of cases. In addition, we, hypothes we hypothesize that chains of such clusters were the core driving force of this epidemic. Therefore, we emphasized finding clusters and try to find a risk factor of such environment. And through characterizing such environment, for example, the ships, buffet, and gyms. And we hypothesize that the closed indoor environment and crowded places were at high risk. And the expert committee, which gave a technical advice to the government of Japan, called for avoiding such environment. And someone in the J government of Japan named it three C's, and it became very popular later on. And in addition to three C's, we also allowed it the shouting and singing is another risk factor because there were several clusters found in karaoke. So that was the story of how we developed this three C concept. That seems to have played a really important role, um, though obviously there will be a significant investigation on what has led to the, um, uh, Japan's relative success compared to many of, other, uh, of our countries on this, um, the three C's campaign, avoiding the three C's seems to be an important aspect uh, for sure. So thank you for that background. Um, and the, if I could share a little bit of a personal story as well, the, um, when living in Tokyo uh, and needed medical care, I was astonished as an American. Um, I went to a, a doctor at a, a health center. I saw a doctor, received an examination, received blood tests, received pharmaceuticals, paid my bills, everything sort of all in one center. Uh, and it was uh, fantastic. It was a type of, of health, um, health provision capacity that we don't really have an equivalent of here in the United States. Um, but I understand that the health centers there, um, as well as other types of facilities, but health centers in particular have played a really important role uh, in both contact tracing and understanding the clusters and uh, and doing that tracing of contacts to, uh, to better understand the outbreak earlier than many of our countries did, but also, of course, in treating people. Uh, are you able to share a little bit about what health centers are like and the role that they've played uh, in addressing COVID-19? I assume that you're mentioning the clinics in our country. So, the, but the contact tracing is performed by uh, local public health centers which may usually provide uh, public health services, not the medical services. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, so let me explain about the lo local public health centers now. So 
the local public health centers covers many community public health services, such as infectious disease control, mental health, maternal and child health, food safety, environmental health, pharmaceutical and medical affairs, including the oversight of medical institutes. So there are staffs with various medical professional background in the center, and especially the public health nurses, nurses play a crucial role for contact tracing. And many pointed out that such contact tracing capacity may be a legacy of tuberculosis, tuberculosis control. As Japan is a moderately endemic country of tuberculosis, so we have maintained the contact tracing capacity, which seems to be an advantage for COVID-19 response. So as for the uh, medical care, as you know, the, we have a universal health coverage system and of which citizens have access to any hospitals, any clinics in a very affordable price. And the more, uh, so you need a consultation, you don't have to go to a family clinics, you can go anywhere directly uh, you want to go. So, and the more the fee for treating COVID-19 is all covered by a public expense, even if you receive an very intensive care using ECMO or ventilators. So in addition, we'd like to mention our very big capacity of CT scan. Uh, the CT scan is widely available, not limited to a large hospital, such as university hospitals. That may have been another advantage for us because it helped a lot for clinically diagnosing the COVID-19 in the early phase. For the CT scans, you're able to see the mark of, the, of, of COVID in the lungs, I assume. That's why CT scans come in helpful? Yeah, uh, when, we, when one of the hospital accepted the uh, patient from the Diamond Princess, one of the hospital accepted so many very mild cases. But as a research, they screened out all of them by CT scan. And they find that almost 40% have some kind of um, um, difference in the, uh, some uh, signs of pneumonia, even they have a, a, a symptomatic. That was a very good uh, observation about how we can uh, detect early about their sign of illness. Excellent, I see. Um, wonderful, and, and yeah, I, um, especially coming from a U.S. standpoint, it seems like the universal access to medical care um, is one of the critical differences uh, that, that has helped Japan in controlling the pandemic. Um, I suspect that we'll learn over time that it perhaps also helps curtail some of the economic damage um, that will uh, uh, that some of our countries will experience as a result uh, of the pandemic, um, given the pricing system and the fact that people are not going to be going bankrupt individually with their healthcare bills and things like that. Um, so it's wonderful to hear. Are there any other uh, characteristic measures uh, that Japan did that you think are worth um, flagging for future reference or for other countries and responding to the current pandemic, but certainly for all of us and um, planning for future pandemics and how to mitigate uh, them uh, building the effects that they have uh, for COVID-19 in many of our countries yeah. that have worked well for Japan? Uh, I'd like to mention about the gate control strategies for providing the uh, uh, PCL diagnosis. In the early phase, many argue that the government of Japan is restricting testing to make the outbreak seem smaller but it was not correct. The government had to use a limited testing capacity for effectively control the disease and minimize the number of deaths by providing care for who needed. And so the government implemented a gate control, gate control strategy for testing uh, using a call center to screen the patient conditions and history and defer to a designated outpatient unit. Because uh, if we openly announce a testing site, people may have flooded there and can be at risk of getting infected there. In addition, the testing site should be well equipped and staff there should be well prepared and trained for infection control. 
So the gate control strategy, gate, our gate control strategy was to protect both the patient and medical resources. That was uh, already planned in the pandemic influenza preparedness and response plan, but it was in, also implemented for the COVID-19 response. That's uh, protecting the medical personnel as well uh, as the patient, very important principle. Um, and uh, I'm familiar uh, with uh, Japan is also, again, a country that has done so well in preparedness, uh, as you say, for getting ready for infectious disease outbreaks and how to control them in these medical centers. And it sounds like that investment in preparedness has really paid off well uh, in mitigating some of the effects of COVID-19, uh, again, relative to, to some of our other countries. Um, on that, uh, in just recent weeks, uh, the infection rate, um, as is the case in many of our countries, of course, uh, in Japan seems to be rising a little bit. Um, but the number of fatalities and severe cases has not risen uh, with the number of cases uh, to an extreme degree, um, especially again compared to some countries like the United States and Brazil and others that ex are experiencing a much more, a much higher rate of severe cases and fatalities. Uh, do you, are, are there theories in Japan or for you as a, as a scientist and a medical leader and response in, in what might be leading to this difference of cases rising but fatalities staying lower? Uh, thank you for the question because we just had a discussion at the advisory board meeting in Minister of Health. So we do need to elaborate more on this uh, interpretation of the data, but our interim analysis, it may be explained by the enhanced surveillance and contact tracing and differences in age of affected populations. Since the end of May, we are extensively testing contacts who have not yet developed disease. So thus, we are finding more asymptomatic cases than before. In addition, as you know, the risk of death among elderly is much higher than younger generation. But in this second wave, so-called second wave, the majority of cases are in younger age, mostly in 20s and 30s. And the, um, so most of the severe cases in uh, 70s. So patient management may be better than before, but uh, I'm not clear about this effect at this stage. So the elder population still need to continue their preventive measures, but the, this small number of deaths may be due to such uh, the sensitivity of the surveillance and the, um, the affected population. Again, even as uh, we're so grateful for professionals like you who are, are working so hard to address the current pandemic, we also are keeping our eye on, you know, the, this is not the last one. There will be future outbreaks that have the risk of growing the pandemic scale. Uh, are you optimistic that based on some of the positive lessons that Japan has been learning and the fact that people like you are, are taking the time to share them with the world uh, and some of the other lessons that we've seen from this, that uh, some of our, that the world will be able to come together and nations will be able to cooperate better in preventing future pandemics of this scale from occurring again? Uh, it's a very difficult question, but as you see, the COVID-19 clearly showed us that severe social and economic gaps exist in the society and these gaps can be a driving force for the disease pandemic not limited to COVID-19. So this cannot be overcome by a region or a region or a single country's effort. So it's really a challenging global issue for the future but I hope this event becomes a wake-up call for global leaders to address these gaps. I hope so as well. Thank you. Yeah. And on that note, uh, Dr. Saito, thank you so much again for your time and for sharing lessons. Uh, Japan being one of the countries that has uh, addressed the COVID-19 pandemic and controlled it uh, better than many of, other, of the other countries in the world. We really greatly appreciate you sharing what you're seeing there, uh, what you're doing, and what the government has been doing to lead to uh, some of those successes in preventing it from getting worse in your country. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for this opportunity.